everyone welcome to another exciting edition of words images and worlds delighted to be peering into the bookshelf here i'm sort of glancing around uh at a space joined by brian patrick avery brian thank you for jumping in joining and talking with me hey, my pleasure thanks for having me my pleasure absolutely thank you for saying yes and as you if you're familiar with the show one of the things that i do as, as you might know is i start by mentioning a couple of titles that mm -hmm. you're best known for and so you have the mr grizzly's class series yes. uh, including camilla's plan you have black men and science and then i believe you also have milo's great safari adventure as well yeah it's actually not out yet it'll be out this summer and so that's a, a series i'm really excited about um uh, coming up this summer I, as a kid i was a really imaginative kid so it was fun to kind of write that character um so i'm really looking forward to that yeah 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 so it sounds like that will be uh sort of an entry into a new series as well for you yeah absolutely yeah yeah very cool very cool yeah. Uh, well, I'm an English teacher. That's what I spend my days doing. And so I am, of course, curious about how you decided that the written word was the place that you wanted to craft and what drew you to it. That's a great question. I uh, It's something that until the last few years, I hadn't really given a lot of thought to. Um, and so I had to kind of go back in my mind through my childhood and all of that and figure out where did this really start? Um, and for me, I, I think it started at a fairly young age, around third, fourth grade. Um, I loved to read growing up, um, and I spent my second grade year reading every Bobsy Twins mystery written, um, mm -hmm. over <laughs> over sixty of them. Um, mm -hmm. I was uh, I was astonished and disappointed to discover that the series didn't just keep going on forever. Yeah. So that was a bit of a struggle for me, but it did push me to read some other things and. Um, I read a lot, and so I finally made my way through a lot of what was available to me through the school library and our local public library and started looking for other things to read. Um, and what I discovered was um, there weren't that many more kids' books to read. And so I went to a, a church function where they had a, a book fair and asked the guy there for some books, and he couldn't really come up with any kids' books. But he gave me what I think he must have thought was – the best thing he had for a kid, it turned out to be wildly inappropriate. It was Lawrence Fox, <laughs> the burglar who loved to quote Kipling, uh -huh, which, uh -huh. you know, the paperback is, and I have it on my bookshelf still, the paperback is, it's fairly thin and it's got a kind of a cartoonish drawing of Bernie Rodenbar on the cover and all of that. And so I can kind of see where he was coming from, but I started reading it and that really opened up my world to the fact that I could, I could read forever. I could, mm -hmm. there's this whole um, collection of books for adults that I could start reading because I could read that and understand it and actually weirdly kind of enjoyed it. Um, nice, and nice. So in reading all of that, I really decided, you know, I, I don't want to just read stuff. I want to make up these stories. Like, like I was saying earlier, I was a really imaginative kid. Um, because I read a lot, I, I spent a lot of time by myself. I'm actually pretty introverted. So the writing life is great for me. <laughs> Publicity part of the writing life uh, requires some work and effort on my part, but uh, <laughs> but and so I I really loved that, and so I started kind of making up stories and making up. It started really with making up casts of characters. I wasn't even creating really stories, just sort of these premises um, around them, and that really got me into it. And then from a writing perspective, I really got into poetry. Um, and so, um, you know, Langston Hughes was always a, a big hero of mine. And that's really where my writing began. I started writing poetry um, and my poetry started to morph as a lot of his poetry did into more stories than just sort of vignettes and so forth. Um, and that's really when I started saying, hey, this is what I, I really want to do. Um, weirdly, I started out writing for adults. I wrote mysteries for adults. Um, throughout my college time and shortly after that. And it wasn't until my daughter was born that um, I started to feel like I was putting a lot more evil and darkness into the world than <laughs> I was really comfortable with, if uh, that makes sense. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. And I spent a ton of time reading to her and reading with her and decided, you know, I really want to put some books that are in my head into the children's reading space. Um, and so in about 2015, um, I said, hey, th you know, this is what I want to do. And I kind of pivoted. Um, and so it took a lot of research because the children's writing world is very different than the adult writing world. 
Um, and so I had to kind of learn that world, learn the people um, and learn kind of the processes even of, of how a lot of that stuff works. And so um, I did that and, and I haven't looked back and I have to say, I don't regret it. Um, mm -hmm. Even though I'm an introvert, I tell people now one of my favorite parts of writing books for children is spending time with young readers um, and the adults who many times buy the books for them yeah. um, talking about reading and writing. I just think it's such an important part of my growing up and, and I think it, it really shaped who I am. And so I want to be able to do that for other kids. And what is that process like for you as you start to dive in and you're exploring a story and kind of fashioning it? Well, it really looks like, so you asked about Milo Gray. Um, so mm -hmm. I started working on that last year um, and it really starts with um, kind of where I started as a writer with a cast of characters. Um, and I actually, I, I use these, um, you know, so thank you very much to my, uh, Moleskine. Uh, my, I've made a career on these notebooks. Um, and usually the first page or two or three of every one of these is a list of a cast of characters and locations. Um, and I really start to kind of put together how they interact long before I come up with the stories themselves. Um, and, and so I have, like in the case of Milo Gray, Milo's got a sister and I wanted him to have a sister because I wanted him to have somebody who could occasionally bring him back to reality, right? Mm -hmm. um, that wasn't a parent because when you write for kids, a big part of writing for kids is kind of getting the adults out of the way and letting the kids have agency and really kind of drive the story. Um, and then I wanted him to have parents because I did want him to have kind of what looked like a, a, a family life that he was also kind of interrupting at times with his imagination and, and kind of getting out of control from time to time. And then, you know, friends and neighbors and all of that. Um, in the case of Milo Gray, he goes on these adventures all around the neighborhood. And for him, his stuffed animals turn into life-size friends that are on these adventures with him, but also the neighborhood transforms. And so in the first book, um, he goes on an outer space adventure and Mars is actually the house of a woman who lives down the street. She's painted her house red. Um, and so that becomes Mars for him. And, and so he really interacts with that. Um, and so in that, in the case of that, I think it was actually four or five pages of notes just around the characters and the locations and all of that. Um, and then I really start to think about, okay, well, what are the stories that I want to tell? Um, and that part of the process doesn't look like writing to most people. Um, it does to me because it's what I've always done, but it involves a lot of walking. I pace around the house, drives my family crazy. Um, <laughs> I walk around the neighborhood and I just sort of think through stories and situations and things like that. Um, and then usually I'll come back and I'll sit down with my notebook and start to jot those down and start to figure out, okay, how can a story about him going on a space adventure, um, how will that play out? What, what kinds of things need to happen? What kinds of things can't happen because he's in space, all of those sorts of things. Um, and then I'm a big, uh, I'm a big plotter. And so I usually put together an outline and all of that, and I'll revise that from time to time. Um, and then when I get to a point where I feel like, okay, now I'm just moving periods around on the page. Mm -hmm. um, then I, I feel like, okay, I'm ready to start writing. Um, and one of the things that has really helped me with using the notebook process is I write everything by hand. I write even, you know, as I get into writing the chapters, I write all those by hand. Um, and so I don't really start with a blank page when I get to page one, because I'm halfway through a notebook at that point. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Um, and so the, the writing part just becomes kind of an extension of all of that planning for me. Um, and it works out well. Nice, nice. I think you and I also have a common uh, affection for the visual because I'm seeing some Star Wars up there. Oh, yeah. I'm seeing uh, words with pictures, Jerry mm -hmm. Craft books. Um, yep. So, yeah, I, I think we have some common loves in that way as well. Yeah, absolutely. I um, I I did a lot of comic book reading as a kid. Um, I thank my brother for that. Read a lot of his comics and mm. Um, and, and so I've always loved the, the graphic novels. Um, I've loved that format. Um, after I finish the next set of um, Milo Gray books, that's my next book actually is a graphic novel. Um, Wonderful. So doing some work on that. Um, 
but yeah, it's always that I've always enjoyed that. And I think that's a part of why I've gravitated towards early readers. Um, so the Mr. Grizzly's class series is an early reader as is the Milo gray series um, mm -hmm. because they're so heavily illustrated. Um, and so it becomes, it's a lot of fun. Uh, Milo gray was a bit of a challenge trying to balance illustrations of the real world with outer space or a safari location and things like that. Um, and so that that challenge, though, it made it a lot of fun for me. But I do like very, very visual books. Um, mm -hmm. I enjoy that. Um, I don't mind reading books that are just prose. Um, and in fact, I've written a few um, middle grade mysteries that are that way. But I do really enjoy that interplay of the images and the words and you know, just having the ability to tell the story in multiple ways for a reader um, has always really appealed to me. Yeah, yeah. Well, looking forward to the graphic novel as well. I usually ask about upcoming work and things of that nature. So uh, very cool uh, and excited to hear about that. You were talking about putting good out into the world and <laughs> the kind of sharing stories in that way. I am curious, what are some of the things that you keep in mind when you're writing for a young audience kind of to that end? Yeah, so... Um... You know, younger readers tend to have a smaller world that they've been exposed to um, when they come to my books, right? And so one of the things I like to do is sort of spark curiosity. Mm -hmm. um, so um, in the case of the Milo Gray series, um, at the end of every Milo Gray book, he and whoever is hanging out with him, they go and have snacks. Uh, my family's Creole, so they're always some sort of Creole snack. So jambalaya or beignets or pralines or something like that. Um, and I do that solely so that kids can look at that and go, I don't know what that is. Mm -hmm. And they can ask somebody or they can find out about it. But, you know, for me, I really look at books as a way that a lot of kids and frankly, a lot of adults get their first exposure to whether it's other cultures or other points of view or just other experiences. Um, and so I try to make sure I build that into my books in a way that's not beating you over the head with it, but mm -hmm. it's just something that, you know, readers can look at and go, huh, that's, that's odd. I, I want to go, I want to go learn more about that. Um, and I know like growing up when I was reading, I was always taught, you know, if you come across something you don't know or don't understand, go look it up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, now that was a time where like we had encyclopedias. And so go look it up, meant going into my my parents' den and looking at a stack of encyclopedias and trying to figure out, well, what to look up where. But with so much access to the Internet now, I think our world is so much smaller. Mm -hmm. You have the ability to very quickly go and figure out, oh, that's a beignet. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so I think that's the, that's the thing that I try to do. And I still get questions when I do school visits, kids will ask me, Hey, what is this? Or they'll tell me, you know what? I had no idea what a praline was. And then I asked my mom and she knew, and then we figured out how to go get some. And so these kids go, they find stuff, um, that I, that I feel like I've kind of hidden in my books, um, mm -hmm. that really sort of stands out to them. And so I really enjoy that part of writing. Um, and I did that a lot, like in the Mr. Grizzly's class series. Um, one of the early books is Mordecai's magic. And so I put a bunch of actual magic tricks in the book, um, just to give kids something to like, try to figure out, well, how is that done? Um, <laughs> A few weeks ago, I was at a school visit, um, had a whole auditorium full of kids. And so afterwards, we all kind of sat around talking. And and that was one of the big things that they were talking about is like, okay, well, how do you do this? How do you, you know, <laughs> how did you make, how did he make that bowling ball fall out of the hat? You know, and it's a magic trick. So I'm not going to tell them how it's done. But I did tell them, you know, the way I learned magic is through books. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I can bet you your library has at least one book on magic. And so if it's something you're interested in, go check it out. And so that's really what I'm thinking about when I'm writing. Um, Black Men in Science is a little different because it's nonfiction. And so the whole idea was, hey, here's some stuff for you to learn about. Um, mm -hmm. But I still tried to make it, um, one, entertaining, but also I wanted to build kind of a thread in it um, for kids to take away. And so there are 15 different um, individuals that are highlighted in the book. And I, those individuals were really selected because they all had a struggle of some sort. Some of it, it was race. Some of it, it was age. It was class. I mean, all kinds of different things, but they all had to struggle through something to be successful. And one of the things I wrote in the author's note at the beginning was that we all have a struggle of some sort. And these are 15 men who've made it through those struggles. You can too. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And that's one of the things that we talk about. Um, 
when when I do school visits and talk about that book is I ask kids, hey, you know, if there's something that you're struggling with, is there somebody in this book you identify with that maybe you can look at how they how they got through that struggle, how they worked through it and still were able to be successful? Um, and that really resonates with readers. And so for me, um, it's as much about entertainment um, because, you know, some of it is is fun. Um, there are still parts of um, the Mr. Grizzly's class series that I laugh hysterically at um, <laughs> because I didn't illustrate them, but I had to write up like what I wanted the illustrations to kind of look like and all of that. And then they handed it off to an illustrator. And some of the stuff that came back, I was just like, this is perfect. I never <laughs> thought of it, but it's absolutely perfect. And uh, my brother and I grew up on, uh, you know, watching Saturday morning cartoons and Wile E. Coyote and, and Roadrunner in particular were like my favorites. And in Nicole's Secret in the Mr. Grizzly's class series, she builds a robot and the robot malfunctions and starts throwing these balls all over the place and breaking everything. And in one of the illustrations, it flings the ball and it looks like, like, you know, Wile E. Coyote being flung off of a catapult just off into the distance forever. And mm. the first time I saw it, I just started laughing hysterically and I could not stop laughing. Um, and so I like them to be entertaining, but I'd also like, you know, readers to walk, be able to walk away from the books and have something to discuss, whether it's mm. with their teacher or their parent or their peers. Um, about the books. And and so that's what I start to think about as I'm writing is what are the things that I can put in here that will give them more than just the the experience of reading this book, but something they can carry on with them. I love that. I love that thoughtful process. And uh, I model that process sometimes of, oh, you want to know what's in this book? Well, we've got the internet right here. Why don't we, does somebody mm -hmm. want to look that up? Because we have so much information right at our fingertips it's it's amazing so I love that you kind of set up those opportunities with that mm -hmm. kind of intention yeah 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 um so that last official question and we mm -hmm. can talk about anything that we might have missed but uh those things that are on the way i know we have the milo series kicking off you mentioned a graphic novel and uh spaces where people can connect with you and follow along with your work yeah absolutely so um the Milo Gray series comes out the first week of August. Um, the first four books will be out. I'm really excited about that. Um, what I'm actually working on right now are the next four, which I'm really wow. excited about because I got that contract before these even came out um, and really even before the ARCs came out. And so um, I was really happy with how the books how the books came together and, and really excited to keep pushing um, this series forward. Um, so I'll be working on that for the um, foreseeable future. And then also in tandem with that, like I said, working on um, a new graphic novel. Um, it's going to be fun for me. The last graphic novel I wrote was science fiction, which was a lot of fun. Um, this is actually um, mystery. And so nice. it's going to be fun to kind of bring a mystery to life in, in the form of a graphic novel. Um, I'm really looking forward to that. Um, and that whole process for me is, um, it's really enjoyable because in addition to all the other things I talked about, um, you have to have a mystery and clues and, you know, suspects, all of those kinds of things. And so I have a process that I go through for that, that I really enjoy. And, and it makes it a lot of fun for me. Um, it fills up a lot of notebooks, but, um, in, in the end, I think, that's that's really good. So so those are the big things that are on the horizon for me. Um, I'll spend the summer doing promo work for for Milo Gray, uh, which is fun. Um, Going to get to bring pralines to a lot of schools when school gets back in session in September. Nice. Um, so I'm looking forward to that and um, putting together. You know, one of the cool things that Milo does in the books is he builds things um that you know kind of come from his imagination and so he takes shoe boxes and turns them into radio frequency receivers and all of that um and so i'm even going to find a few schools where we're going to do an imagination fair and let kids come up with their own things based on the books that they can build and and all of that so i'm really looking forward to that like i said i'm kind of an introvert but i do enjoy spending time with uh, with young readers and so i'm uh, looking forward to that um, oh, cool. In terms of where people can find me between now and then, um, brianpatrickavery.com is my website. You can read about my books, uh, my background. It has links to my social media, um, generally on Facebook, um, Instagram, and um, LinkedIn, all is Brian Patrick Avery, so pretty easy to find. Brian with a Y, I always tell people that. Um, though with my website, if you type in Brian with an I, you'll get there as well. Um, oh, nice, but, nice. Um, but yeah, so uh, look forward to seeing people. I love to, you know, I get um, 
I get a lot of mail from readers when I go out and do school visits and, and all of that. And, and I really enjoy having the opportunity to kind of write back. They usually write and send questions, uh, which is always fun. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, cause I, I do like for my books to kind of spark questions uh, for readers. So I'm, I'm happy to answer questions and so forth. So. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, Brian, thank you for the work. Thank mm -hmm. you for the time. Is there anything that we missed that you want to make sure to mention before we close? No, I just, um, my big thing is, has always been, and I, I always tell people as often as I can, um, if you're writing, um, make room for everyone. Um, and if you're reading, um, you know, find a way to read about everyone. Um, I think it's, you know, you may not have a chance in your life to come across all the types of people that are out there. I don't think many of us will, um, but there's an opportunity to kind of learn about um, our fellow humans and and maybe kind of humanize people a little bit more um, just by reading about them in books. So seek out opportunities to learn more about people who are different from yourself is the thing I always ask of readers. Love it. Love it. Very well said. And on that note, I'll say thank you again. I'm glad to have you thank back you. anytime. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much. Have a good one. You too. Thanks.